Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Nutritional Management of Canine and Feline Gastrointestinal Conditions, co-sponsored by Henry Schein Animal Health and Nestle Purina Pet Care. Before I introduce our speaker today, just a few bits of housekeeping to go over. You can submit your questions throughout the webinar in the questions pane of your GoToWebinar panel. We're going to have a question and answer session at the very end of our presentation. Today is July 28, 2016, and this is a live webinar. Today's webinar attendees are eligible to receive one and a half continuing education credits. If you are watching a recording of this webinar, you will not be eligible to receive any CE credits. At the end of the live webinar today, a form will appear for each attendee. Please complete every field on that form, and then you can expect to receive your CE certificate via email in about two weeks. Remember, you must stay on for the entire webinar, or you will not see the form to complete to get your CE credits. Now on to our webinar. We're very pleased to have Dr. Lauren Palugi with us today. Dr. Palugi attended Rutgers University for her Bachelor's of Arts and obtained her veterinary degree from Colorado State University. Upon graduation, she completed an internship in small animal medicine and surgery at Oradell Animal Hospital in New Jersey. She then joined Absecon Veterinary Hospital, a seven-doctor general practice in New Jersey. Lauren currently resides in Linwood, New Jersey, serving as a veterinary communications manager for Nestle Purina Pet Care. Spreading passion for advanced nutrition, she supports veterinary teaching hospitals throughout the country and provides technical support for Purina's sales consultants. She continues to pra practice as a relief veterinarian in South Jersey and also serves as the veterinarian for the New Jersey Animal Advocacy Alliance Mobile Spay and Neuter Clinic. In addition to nutrition, Lauren has a key interest in small animal surgery and cardiology. Lauren spends all of her free time with her twin toddlers, Zachary and Felix. Lauren also enjoys running, yoga, surfing, and snowboarding with her husband, Michael. She loves spoiling her two dogs, Bruno and Coda, and her two cats, Cecilia and Daniela. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lauren Pellucci. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate the introduction. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon for our webinar. Today, we'll be talking about the nutritional management of canine and feline gastrointestinal conditions. So let's first, let's see, my screen is pausing again. Sorry, guys, a couple of technical difficulties here. Okay, so we'll first go through the major functions of the gastrointestinal tract. And it's important to keep these in mind when we think about what's actually going on with GI disease. So some of the major functions that we think of are digestion and absorption of nutrients, water balance, protection from foreign substances and toxins, and immune function. And when we have disruption of any one of these major functions of the GI tract, one of the clinical manifestations we might see is diarrhea. So what is diarrhea? Here is the actual definition. It's the passage of feces containing excess water resulting in an increase of the fluidity, volume, and or frequency of defecations. But what's most helpful when we're seeing diarrhea in our patients is to be able to classify it in some way. Functional categorization of diarrhea isn't something that we typically do, but if possible, it may make it a little bit more helpful to determine the cause of the diarrhea and then the treatment. Some different types of functional diarrhea that we might see are osmotic diarrhea, secretory diarrhea, increased mucosal permeability, and this can be from damage to the intestinal tract, or deranged motility. What we're more used to as far as categorizing diarrhea is talking about how long it's been going on. So is it an acute case of diarrhea, or has this been a long-standing case of diarrhea? And where is it located? Is it mostly small bowel signs or large bowel signs? What's going to help you most in being able to categorize the diarrhea, and therefore figuring out the cause and then the treatment, is to ask some very important history questions to your clients. You don't want to just ask, is there any vomiting or diarrhea? You want to get some specific details. Was it a gradual or abrupt onset of the diarrhea? What does the diarrhea look like? If the owner is able to bring in a sample, if you're unable to get one in the clinic, that could be very helpful in helping you to know whether it's a large or a small bowel or a mixed bowel case of diarrhea. Using charts like our fecal scoring guide can be really helpful as well because sometimes what you might call diarrhea might not be what the owner is referring to, or vice versa. 
Duration of signs is, an, is a very important question. Sometimes this information can be a little bit difficult to get from our clients, but you might want to ask just general GI signs, not just about diarrhea. Was there borderygmus going on? Does the uh, dog have uh, excess flatulence? Um, uh, changes in their appetite, vomiting, regurgitation. These can all point to a long uh, history of GI signs. How about any changes in the animal's environment or in their diet? Have they been kenneled recently or have they traveled? Even good excitement, like guests coming in from out of town, can cause enough stress to cause a dog or a cat to outbreak with diarrhea. Their medical history is equally important. You want to make sure that they don't have any other concurrent diseases going on, or if they do have other concurrent diseases going on, could they possibly have a secondary GI issue? And deworming and vaccine history, we always think about in our young population, in our kittens and in our puppies, but it's very important not to forget this in our older population of dogs and cats that present with GI disease. Treating for worms or other intestinal parasites is much easier than ignoring them. So if we preemptively treat for some of these different causes of vomiting and diarrhea, sometimes we can um, really get rid of their problem in a much more simple way. So don't forget about getting a good vaccine history and getting a fecal uh, flow and a, a fecal cytology on these patients. Other pets in the household, um, are any of them affected? Do any of them have similar signs going on? And then what other systemic signs are going on? Is the pet overweight? Is the pet having trouble breathing? Is the pet having trouble getting up or down? All of this can affect their GI tract. So this is just a chart that helps you to classify whether or not a patient has small intestinal or large intestinal diarrhea. And I'm sure that you've seen charts similar to this one before. One thing I'd like to point out is the first line there, tenesmus. Make sure that you're always doing a rectal examination on all of your patients. Sometimes tenesmus can be due to a polyp or a mass in the rectum. And typically when we see those cases, their feces is more ribbon-like. So you want to make sure that you're not missing that as a potential cause of tenesmus. Many of the patients that we see will fall into one category or the other, but there is a subset that will have mixed bowel diarrhea. And this makes sense for a multi uh, multitude of reasons. So in all of these cases, diet can be a very important component um, for any GI condition. The problem is, trying to decide which gastrointestinal diet to use, because there's a lot of different options out there. Do we want to choose a low fiber diet? Do we want to choose a high fiber diet? What are prebiotics in relation to probiotics? What about fiber? Do we want lots of fiber or small amount of fiber? And how about hydrolyzed diets or alternative protein diets? It can get overwhelming as we have more and more options, which make it great for our patients, but a little bit confusing when we have to keep up with so much as veterinarians. So today we'll be discussing in detail dietary fat. We'll be going through low or high fat, medium chain triglycerides, the benefits of omega-3 fatty acids. We'll be talking about carbohydrates in relation to feline gastrointestinal diets. We'll be talking about colostrum and how colostrum added to a diet can actually enhance the immune system. We'll be discussing fiber. Uh, specifically, uh, we'll go into detail about insoluble fiber and soluble fiber when referring to large bowel diarrhea. And we'll go a little bit more into detail about prebiotics as well, which are a type of uh, soluble fiber. Today we're not going to discuss um, hydrolyzed diets or novel protein diets, but please do keep in mind that these are a very good option for some of your GI cases, especially your cases of inflammatory bowel disease, which may benefit from being on a hydrolyzed protein diet or a novel protein diet. In some of those cases of inflammatory bowel disease, there's a food sensitivity component that we're not always aware of until we start that animal on a hydrolyzed diet. So make sure to keep that in your back pocket when you're treating those difficult cases of IBD. Probiotics is another important topic that we won't be discussing today, but definitely you should keep in your repertoire of treatments for GI disease. We know that the microflora in our body is, uh, makes up more, um, more organisms than all the cells in our body, and it plays a very important role in our GI health overall. 
So giving some of these animals with chronic GI conditions probiotics on a regular basis can help to restore that balance in their GI tract. And prebiotics, as I mentioned, are soluble fibers that actually help to feed the good bacteria in the GI tract. We'll go into a little bit more detail at the end of the presentation. So let's start with talking about fat digestion and absorption. We're all familiar with long-chain triglycerides. These are a type of fat that make up our essential fatty acids, and they require bile salts from the liver and pancreatic lipase for complete digestion. Let's go through a little diagram, diagram here to talk about their um, digestion and absorption. So you can see our large lipid droplet there on the left, mixing with bile salts that need to um, be produced by the liver. They then mix with those bile salts to be broken down into their individual fatty acids and monoglycerides before they can be absorbed into the mucosal cell that line the GI tract. Once they're in that mucosal cell, they need to be repackaged into chylomicrons and eventually they're transported into the lymphatic vessel. Now this can be a problem in some of the cases of GI disease that we see. There's many different causes of fat malabsorption diarrhea, and this is just a small list of some of those causes. These may include inflammatory bowel disease. Again, as I mentioned early, earlier, some cases of inflammatory bowel disease will benefit from being on a hydrolyzed protein diet such as HA. Intestinal lymphoma is another syndrome that we see in dogs and in cats. And in dogs specifically, we like to restrict their fat. Food allergy and gluten sensitivity, some of these animals have difficulty digesting fat. Lymphangiectasia, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, pancreatitis, intestinal histoplasmosis, severe cholestasis, and villus atrophy. Villus atrophy is important to think of when you're thinking of any infectious disease that affects the GI tract. When we have something that actually is attacking the GI tract, it often causes damage to the villi that are at the ends of our mucosal cells, and that will actually affect the absorption of fat. So think of that in some of your cases, such as parvovirus. So if we need to restrict fat due to malabsorption, we do need to keep in mind that there are some consequences when we restrict fat. Fat's really important for a number of reasons. It uh, makes a diet very palatable. It also provides calories to a diet. So when we restrict fat, sometimes the diet becomes a little bit lower in calories. So what can we do to address difficulties with fat absorption in dogs? So we can consider medium chain triglycerides as a possible energy source. So what are medium chain triglycerides? You may be familiar with medium chain triglycerides if you've ever used a diet like Bright Mind that's geared towards health of the brain. Um, MCTs are being studied by um, both uh, human physicians and in veterinary medicine. And we're very interested in them for a variety of reasons. When we think of them for brain health, we know that they're helpful because they're used as an alternate source of energy in our aging population of dogs whose brains aren't at, as good at using glucose as energy. When we use them in a GI diet, we like them because they're very easily digested. So let's go through the steps to digestion of medium chain triglycerides versus long chain triglycerides. So medium chain triglycerides are mostly absorbed in the small intestines. They're both broken down by gastric acids and rapidly absorbed in the small intestines, and they don't require much pancreatic lipase or bile acids from the liver, just a small amount, but not as much as compared to long chain triglycerides. They're transported directly into the portal vein versus clogging up the lymphatic system as we see with long chain triglycerides. Long chain triglycerides, as we've already gone through, require bile acids and then they need to be repackaged in the enterocytes into chylomicrons and then transported into the lymphatic system before they go into general circulation. So if we replace a portion of the long chain triglycerides, remember we can't replace all of the LCTs because they do provide an essential source of fatty acids to our pets 
and they taste better than medium chain triglycerides. However, if we, we replace a portion of them with medium chain triglycerides, we can help some of these animals that are suffering from fat malabsorption. So just to reiterate, the pros of using medium chain fatty acids in a GI diet is that they're easily digested, easily absorbed, and easily oxidized. This is one study that looked at fat digestibility of long chain triglycerides versus medium chain triglycerides in normal dogs versus dogs with exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And in normal dogs, we can see that there's virtually no difference between their digestion and the two types of fat. However, in a dog with a condition that we know causes fat malabsorption, we can see a gigantic difference between the two types of fat. So long chain triglycerides are very difficult to digest in a dog with EPI, whereas medium chain triglycerides have digestibility up to 77% in this population of dogs. Some cons of using medium chain triglycerides is that there's still some entry into lymphatics, but not like long chain triglycerides. They're also not a source of essential fatty acids, as we mentioned a couple of times, and they may not aid in absorption of fat-soluble vitamins. Also, as I mentioned earlier, they don't taste very good, so if we put too, too much in a diet, it will affect palatability. So when does fat really matter? When do we want to use an ultra-low fat diet or intervene with something much lower fat than what the pet is currently eating? So lymphangiectasia is a problem that we see in a population of dogs. It's a pathologic dilation of lymph vessels, and this disease is characterized by lymphatic vessel dilation, chronic diarrhea, and loss of proteins such as serum albumin and globulin. Hyperlipidemia is another condition where lipids can build up in the blood. We often see this in certain breeds, like in schnauzers. And in severe cases of pancreatitis, most cases of pancreatitis require diets that are about 4 to 6 grams of fat per 100 kcal. Most of the GI diets out on the market fall right within that range, uh, so there's no problem feeding a traditional GI diet to most cases of pancreatitis. However, in your severe cases that need an ultra-low fat diet, sometimes that's the best option. And what about cats? Do cats require a low fat diet? We've all heard many, many times throughout our veterinary training that cats are not small dogs and vice versa. And the same holds true when we're talking about GI disease. So this was a study done by Dr. Dottie Laflamme. She looked at 55 client-owned animals that had chronic diarrhea. None of these cats could have had any evidence of a non-GI cause, and they had to have prior treatment for intestinal parasites so that we knew that wasn't a reason for their chronic diarrhea. They were split into two groups, and they were fed either a low-fat diet or a high-fat diet as the only change between the two diets. Both diets were considered highly digestible diets. Diet was the only change, and they didn't have any other additional med medications throughout the study. And the main measures were looking at their fecal score, and at the time, the fecal scoring guide that was used went from 0 to 100, with 100 being uh, firm, normal stool and zero being very, very loose stool. And their frequency of defecation was also recorded. The results of the study is that there was no overall change in frequency. However, both diets caused a significant improvement in fecal score. So 78% of cats improved to a fecal score greater than 66, and 36% of cats improved to a normal stool. So the conclusion was that there was no difference between diets, and specifically for feline diarrhea, controlling dietary fat does not appear to be the same issue that we see in dogs. What about carbohydrates? Now we know that carbohydrate digestion is a little bit different when we're talking about cats with gastrointestinal disease. So when we're talking about our normal, happy, healthy cats, the majority of our population of cats who are eating kibble, we know that they have no problem digesting carbohydrates. So let's go through the normal digestion process of a carb in a dog and a cat. So cats and dogs do have pancreatic amylase. However, they both do lack salivary amylase. There's a variety um, of, of different types of intestinal enzymes help to break down carbohydrates. 
And the amounts of these enzymes actually varies in dogs, cats, and in people as well. So some dogs and cats actually lack lactase. Same thing goes in people. If we properly process our carbohydrates, meaning we properly cook them, they're made in a good kibble, digestibility will reach over 90% in most cases. So as I mentioned, almost all of the cats that we see in practice that are healthy, normal cats are eating some form of kibble that have carbohydrate in them and they have no problem with digestion. So what goes wrong in cats is when we have some type of damage to that GI tract. So remember when we go back to the functions of the GI tract, and digestion and absorption of nutrients is one of those major functions. Well, if we have damage to those villi, the little appendages that stick out from the, um, the cells that line the GI tract, that can cause carbohydrate maldigestion or malabsorption. And any leftover monosaccharides, the breakdown product of carbohydrates that are in the intestines can cause osmotic diarrhea. And we do know that carbohydrate malabsorption is common in certain cases of feline GI disease, such as feline inflammatory bowel disease. So some of this came from looking at our diabetic population of cats. We saw that diabetic cats that were fed a high-protein, low-carbohydrate diet had a benefit in resolving some chronic diarrhea issues that they had. So Dr. Laflamme et al. also did another study looking at the effects of different levels of dietary carbohydrates on a population of cats with chronic diarrhea. So in this study, she took two groups of cats and she fed them either a diet that was low in carbohydrates or moderate in carbohydrates. So in the first phase, about 12 cats were fed low carb, 19 cats were fed moderate carbohydrate diet. In the low carb group, about 50% improved. And improved animals stayed on that same diet. They were not put on the alternate diet. This was not a double crossover study. The cats that did not improve were switched to the moderate carbohydrate diet. And on the moderate carbohydrate diet, an additional 25% of those cats improved. The cats that started on our moderate carbohydrate diet, only about 21% of those cats improved. The remaining cats were put on a low carbohydrate diet and 40% of those cats improved. So we can see overall more cats did better on a low carbohydrate diet. And both of these diets were considered highly digestible. So the results overall, total of 24 cats were fed a moderate carbohydrate diet, nine cats had an improvement in their fecal score to greater than 66 and four cats to greater than 75 and 26 cats that were fed low-carbohydrate diet, 12 cats had an improvement of their fecal score greater than 66, and 6 cats greater than 75. Another study looked at evaluation of two different diets that are marketed for feline diarrhea. 15 cats with diarrhea um, were entered into the study, and they had to have diarrhea for at least three months. Same as the prior study, they had to be previously treated for intestinal parasites and have no evidence of a non-GI cause. This was a randomized cro uh, controlled crossover trial. So what was done is that one group of cats was fed the first diet for one month, and then fecal scores were taken, and they were switched over to the other diet for the second month, and fecal scores were taken again. And during this study, this was our new fecal scoring guide that was used. That was from a scale of one to seven, with seven being very watery, loose stool, two being about ideal, and one being firm, hard stool. So fecal score in response to diet, we looked at improvement based on greater than one fecal score unit. In diet A, we had about 40% of cats improve at least one fecal score, whereas in diet B, we had about 67% of the cats improve at least one fecal score. And the main differences between the two diets were protein levels. So diet B was a high protein diet. Fat levels were, were pretty comparable. And as we've already discussed, fat levels in uh, diets formulated for cats with gastrointestinal disease doesn't really seem to matter. Diet B was also higher in omega-3 fatty acids, so there's a lot of evidence of omega-3 fatty acids having an anti-inflammatory effect and many other diseases like 
skin disease, and osteoarthritis. Carbohydrate levels really the biggest difference between these two diets. So carbohydrate levels significantly lower in, in a diet B when compared to diet A. So how about colostrum? Colostrum is something that we can add to a gastrointestinal diet to actually have an effect on the immune system. So as we talked about earlier, the major functions again of that GI tract, immune function is one very important factor. And that's because 70% of all of the immune cells in the entire body live in our GI tract. And we refer to that as our gut-associated lymphoid tissue. So with colostrum, we actually can get antibodies from the colostrum that will interact with the immune cells that line the GI tract. It was previously thought that colostrum was only beneficial during those first few days after a puppy or a kitten is born, during that phase of what we call passive transfer. But it's since been discovered that colostrum actually can benefit all ages of dogs and cats, specifically their immune system. So let's go through what actually happens. So antibodies that are in the colostrum will bind to the immune cells that are lining the GI tract. Those antibodies are internalized by immune cells, and then those cells become activated. And those cells will produce both a systemic response, where cytokines are secreted into the system, stimulating other immune cells, and it will also cause a local immune response, releasing IgA into the GI tract. So we always like to base all of our nutritional research on actual studies. So this study was done out in Alaska by Dr. Arlie Reynolds, who looked at actually his own group of sled dogs, 24 Alaskan sled dogs that were about two to six years of age. This is one of our perfect uh, groups of dogs that we use for some of our studies because they are perfect model for exercise stress. So at Purina, we're very, very strict with non-invasive studies. We don't allow any harm to be done to any of the animals that are eating our diets. So in this population of dogs, during their high intense training time, they typically have a natural outbreak of diarrhea. So these dogs were split into two groups, a test diet and then the exact diet, but with added bovine colostrum. They were looked at for 40 weeks and their gut and immune health was monitored. So trial one was to look at the effect of the colostrum on their microflora. And as we talked about briefly at the beginning of this presentation, we know that the microflora especially the stability of the microflora in our GI tract is very important to our overall health. So our control group, we can see, had about a 46% stability of, in their microflora during their outbreak of diarrhea, whereas our colostrum-fed group had an 82% stability of microflora during their high-intense training levels. We also measured fecal IgA levels. We wanted to see if what we thought would happen, the colostrum stimulating the immune system, actually did. So here's week zero, our control group versus our colostrum fed group. Essentially there's no statistical difference between them at week zero. And then at week 40, we can see that fecal IgA levels are significantly higher in the group that was fed the test diet plus bovine colostrum. And lastly, we wanted to look at systemic IgG levels. And the way that we do this is to actually give these dogs a vaccine and attach that IgG to that vaccine so that we can measure it in their blood. So here's our control group, a normal response to a vaccine. And here is our group that was colostrum fed. So they had an, a longer, more sustained response to that vaccine. So their body's immune system was stimulated and enhanced from the colostrum in their diet. We've seen similar results in cats as well, so there is a benefit to putting colostrum in a diet formulated for cats with gastrointestinal disease as well. So this is our canine formula VN. It contains the prebiotic alurone, colostrum, it also has MCTs, and it is approved for growth and maintenance in the dry formula and improved for maintenance in the canned formula. We also will be launching EN Low Fat at the end of August this year. This will be the lowest fat diet on the market with a prebiotic inulin, high total digestibility, and moderate calorie density. The canned formula also has the prebiotic inulin and moderate calorie density. 
And then our feline product is a high protein, low carbohydrate diet. We also have EN Naturals, which have the same benefits as the original formulas, but they're formulated without corn or wheat, and they're considered natural based by AFCO standards. So we'll move on to discussing canine large bowel diarrhea. So again, we go back to that chart helping us to categorize what type of diarrhea we're having. Make sure to always do that rectal examination so you're not missing any type of uh, anatomy abnormalities in the rectum or any type of pa uh, mass or polyp. Be sure to get a biochemistry panel on these patients and always do a fecal examination to rule out intestinal parasites. So then you're going to put that patient into one of two categories. Are they essentially healthy except for the diarrhea or are they not healthy? Are they suffering from other systemic signs such as weight loss, hypoalbuminemia, or rectal lesion? If they're falling in that first category of weight loss, hypoalbuminemia, or rectal lesion, I recommend doing further diagnostics, including abdominal ultrasound, plus or minus radiographs, and possibly intestinal biopsies. If they're essentially healthy except for the diarrhea, so they're that happy lab coming in, bouncing off the walls, and the owner just complaining of loose stool all the time, then I recommend doing some therapeutic trials first. And these might include an antibiotic trial, an anthelmintic trial, and a dietary trial. Depending on whether or not they fail or succeed, if they succeed, fantastic, continue with that treatment. If they fail, then you want to go ahead and do some more diagnostics. So this makes it pretty simple in dealing with your large bowel diarrhea cases. So antibiotic responsive diarrhea is just that. You try them on an antibiotic, and if their dia diarrhea goes away and then comes back once you stop that antibiotic, then you have now defined antibiotic responsive diarrhea. Tylosin can be used long term. Please note that this is a new dosage of tylosin. This is 10 milligrams per kilogram once a day. It's no longer recommended to be given every um, eight hours for two weeks at least. And then if you stop the tylosin and the diarrhea comes back, you have uh, antibiotic responsive diarrhea. Metronidazole, we don't really recommend giving long term. However, the dose is 10 to 15 milligrams per kilogram every 12 hours. And make sure to be giving both of these with a highly digestible diet. Don't forget about your parasites and also um, different fungal um, causes of large bowel diarrhea. Make sure you're doing a little bit of research of the area you're in. Sometimes there's some different causes that we're not as familiar with or that aren't necessarily as common. And again, this all goes back to getting a good history from your owners. And then diet. So many, many large intestinal disorders in dogs are fiber responsive. This is a little bit less common in cats. So what is fiber responsive diarrhea? We can define this as a chronic large bowel diarrhea of unknown origin that responds to different types and levels of fiber. So we know that fiber has a variety of different effects on the GI tract. There's a pH effect, water absorption and adsorption effect, dilutional effect, motility effect, and a microflora effect as well. There's different types of soluble, uh, excuse me, of different types of fiber that can be beneficial when we're thinking of large bowel diarrhea. And these may include soluble fibers, which may be pectins and gums, inulin or chicory, or oligosaccharides. Soluble fibers are water soluble, viscous, fermentable, and they do slow GI transit. Insoluble fibers you may think of when you see cellulose or wheat bran or possibly peanut holes on a pet food label. These are not water soluble, they adsorb water, and they're less fermentable and cause fecal bulk. And then there are some mixed fiber sources, such as beet pulp, soybean holes, pea fiber, and psyllium. But too much of a good thing makes it bad. So too much soluble fiber can lead to watery stools, and too much insoluble fiber can lead to a large stool volume. So you're looking for a good balance between these two when talking about dietary therapy for large bowel diarrhea. So EN fiber balance, which was formerly known as DCO, we changed the name, uh, there's no change in formulation, does have a blend of both soluble and insoluble fibers, which will slow, slow uh, transit time and allow for 
um, some of that water to be reabsorbed. Moderate levels of fat, calories, and protein to help maintain a weight. This is not a low calorie diet. And it has the prebiotic alurone. We'll go into detail about what prebiotics are at the end of this presentation. So how about the cat, the constipated cat? We don't deal with colitis as frequently in our cat population. However, we do deal with large bowel disease, and this typically uh, manifests as a constipated cat. Most of these cats that we see are middle-aged, male, overweight cats. I typically remember all of these cases always coming in as my last appointment of the day. I've never failed. Clinical signs, they may just be really, really lethargic. They actually might have some weight loss or have some vomiting, anorexia, dehydration, dyskesia, and hematochesia. It's really important when these patients are coming in to try to check their bladder because a lot of blocked cats can look like a constipated cat and vice versa. So sometimes snapping a radiograph can give you all of the information that you need if you see a big giant bladder or if you see a big giant colon backed up with stool. Diagnosis of these cats, it is helpful to look for underlying disease. Sometimes it's just obesity. Sometimes it's the fact that this cat lives in a multiple cat household and their environment is very stressful to them and they don't want to use the litter box. Or maybe there's an underlying cause of dehydration. Make sure you're having that discussion with the owners um, of these cats. So environment is so, so important. Dr. Buffington has a great website about the Indoor Cat Initiative, helping to reduce some of their stress, making sure that you have enough litter boxes, making sure that the cats like the litter boxes that they have, that they're clean all of the time, that they're being stimulated in some way. I think that we're doing a disservice to our clients if we're not addressing this extremely important component of husbandry and cats. So what do we do for our constipated cats? Hopefully we figure out why it's happening to them so we could prevent further um, recurrence of this issue. But when we do see these patients in clinics, we want to make sure that we're properly hydrating them, we're giving them an enema, we're putting them on a laxative, and possibly on a prokinetic. Dietary management may include switching them to a canned food or adding water to their dry kibble or putting them on a diet that's high in soluble and insoluble fiber. And depending on the degree of constipation, you may want to put them on a high fiber diet, or if they're obstipated, you may want to think about actually putting on them on a highly digestible diet. So if they're obstipated, you may not want to create any more fecal bulk. At that point, you probably need to put them on something that's extremely high in digestibility, like EN. And lastly, we'll go over what prebiotics are. So you'll hear a lot about prebiotics out there in the market. Prebiotics and probiotics have a similar name, but they're actually quite different. So remember, probiotics are the good bacteria that you actually add to the GI tract. So these are something that you take orally, um, such as in the case of Fortiflora, um, and the good bacteria will travel to the large intestines and set up shop there for a few days to help to normalize the existing microflora. Prebiotics are actually a type of fiber. So these are non-digestible carbohydrate sources, and they come from soluble fibers, and they actually pass unchanged to the large intestines. This special type of fiber is fermented by good bacteria specifically, not by the bad bacteria. And there's a lot of good things that come from this. They essentially act like food for the good bacteria in the GI tract. Some different examples of prebiotics that you may be familiar with include fructooligosaccharides, monooligosaccharides, um, inulin or chicory, alurone. These are very commonly found in a lot of the prescription pet foods that are considered high fiber. Also, if you take a fiber supplement, like those little chewy um, vitamins, you'll often see that that's inulin in those supplements. So what do alurone and inulin actually do? So these are two of the more common um, prebiotics you'll see in the Purina therapeutic diets. 
So first, as I mentioned, they help improve colonic microbial balance. So they actually stimulate the growth of beneficial bacteria. Those bacteria can then produce short-chain fatty acids. And what those short-chain fatty acids do is help to nourish those colonocytes. So think of those colonocytes that have been damaged from any GI disease. They need those short-chain fatty acids to turn over and to become healthy again. So this study was looking at the comparison of beet pulp versus alurone. So one of the short-chain fatty acids that's most important and produced by the good bacteria as they break down prebiotics is called butyric acid. And butyric acid will specifically nourish the intestinal cells and help imp improve absorption of nutrients. So we wanted to see what the production of butyric acid was in beet pulp versus in alurone. And we can see that by using alurone, the body is able to produce a significantly higher level of butyric acid, which again is really important in the health of our GI tract. Prebiotics such as alurone and inulin will improve fecal quality, um, so they've been uh, shown to statistically significantly improve fecal firmness, decrease fecal moisture, and improve fecal quality overall. So how do they all fit together? So prebiotics and probiotics can be used to enhance each other. Um, so again, in a lot of these cases that we see of chronic GI disease, the microflora of these patients is not normal. Often we have them in antibiotics that will wipe out their GI tract. So it's very helpful to give them an oral probiotic and give them a GI diet that has a prebiotic in there, again, to help feed those good bacteria and get that GI tract back into good shape. So this is our entire GI line. Um, we discussed several of these diets today, or at least some of the characteristics of some of these diets today. And you can look for those same characteristics in GI diet in general. We didn't go into detail, as I mentioned, about our hydrolyzed diets or about probiotics in general. But again, remember that a hydrolyzed diet may be a good option in some of your small bowel diarrhea cases that are not responding to a highly digestible GI diet. There's many different options out there for you in the hydrolyzed diet market. And often, when we do see a response to a hydrolyzed diet, in a patient with GI disease, we're usually seeing that pretty quickly. So we're seeing that in maybe a two to four week period versus when we're talking about using a hydrolyzed diet for a patient with dermatologic disease, we're not seeing a response typically until about eight to 12 weeks. So don't forget about that in your difficult GI cases that aren't responding to your first line diet options. There are some great resources out there. Um, I bring this up, um, mainly the chart on the left. This is a fecal scoring chart. Um, these are available um, for you. Uh, you can also make up your own version of this in the clinic. I think that they're very helpful to make as part of your regular physical exam on your patients because it's an objective way to score feces. So again, as I mentioned, Miss Smith might think that perhaps a five is normal for her dog, Fluffy, because Fluffy is only ever pooped a number five. So in her mind, that's normal. Um, or vice versa, um, uh, you may have an owner with a cat whose stools look like number one, and they're wondering why that cat is straining to go to the bathroom in the litter box. You may ask them if their stool's normal, and they'll say, yeah, perfectly normal. So this is something very helpful that a client can actually point to and tell you what their patient's stool looks like. And then again, just reiterating the importance of classifying the clinical signs of large bowel versus small bowel diarrhea. This can really help you decide which treatment as far as a dietary recommendation goes for your patient. If they fall into that mixed bowel criteria, typically we're leaning towards dietary recommendations that fall in that small bowel clinical sign category. 
If you ever have other additional questions, um, there is a resource center at Purina where you can talk to one of our fabulous technicians who can give you specific information on any diets. They can also, also put you in contact with Dr. Elizabeth McKenna. She's our veterinarian that works at the resource center, and she can go through specific cases, just general nutrition cases with you if you have any problems. And then our call to action is um, a special we are running. Uh, once we launch EN Low Fat, this will be launched August 29th, and this promo will be going on through the entire month of September. And that is a buy one, get one free promo. And you can reach out to your Henry Shine rep for more information or to your Purina veterinary consultant. And just one, one final word. Um, as far as um, using an ultra-low fat diet versus a traditional just gastrointestinal diet. We talked about um, cases of lymphangiectasia or hyperlipidemia or severe pancreatitis. Those are really the cases um, that you want to restrict fat um, more so than what the traditional gastrointestinal diets have in them. But for the majority of your GI cases, restricting fat to this level um, is not necessary. It's still an option, but it's not necessary. So that's everything I have for you guys today. And we have about 14 minutes or so for questions. Yes, so and thank, much. You. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Felitti. This has been really interesting, and we do have a number of questions, and the audience has been pretty active here. Um, our first, we have several questions. Um, several people missed the section about diabetic cats with diarrhea, um, and so they want more information about that. Sure. So there's been a lot of research looking at diabetic cats with diarrhea, um, specifically when we feed them a high-protein, low-carbohydrate diet. So we know that um, cats with diabetes benefit from being on a high-protein, low-carbohydrate diet um, in relation to their actual kidney, or excuse me, diabetes going on. So it can help to put them in remission. All of the studies um, that look at diabetic cats going into remission have actually used a high-protein, low-carbohydrate can diet. Now, this same group of cats often have other systemic signs of their disease. So they're not just having their signs of being diabetic, but they're also having concurrent GI signs. And what we've seen in the literature is that these same group of cats that have diabetes have concurrent GI signs and then go on a high-protein, low-carbohydrate diet. A lot of their GI signs will resolve just from making that dietary change. All right, excellent. Um, someone wants to know, did you say that mixed bowel signs should be treated like small bowel diarrhea? Yeah, so uh, with, with regards to dietary recommendations, yes. So when they fall into, when they have, um, when they have um, characteristics from both of those sides of the chart, both small bowel signs and large bowel signs, we call that group of animals mixed bowel diarrhea. I would start them with dietary therapy that falls under the small bowel diarrhea signs. So you want them on something that's highly digestible. Perhaps you need to try them on something ultra low fat. Perhaps you have to try them on a hydrolyzed diet. And if they're not responding to any of that, at that point you might want to try something under the large bowel, bowel category, so something more higher in fiber and including uh, mixed sources of fiber as well. But first, um, first off, you want to treat them like a small bowel diarrhea case. All right. Uh, someone would, would like to know how often and how much colostrum should be fed to a dog or a cat with GI issues? So the only um, diets that currently contain colostrum in them are the Purina formulations and this proprietary information as far as how much is in the diets. Um, so the research that was done was used, uh, used actual EN kibble um, that's enhanced with colostrum. It's only in the kibble formulations. The reason why is because it's actually sprayed to the outside of the kibble. So we can't 
have it in our CAN formulations because the colostrum is actually degraded. The antibodies are broken down um, from the CAN being hermetically sealed. So it's only in those dry formulations right now, um, and it's not in our low-fat formula because in order to get the colostrum to stick to the outside of the kibble, it needs to be sprayed with a little bit more fat. So that would have increased the fat percentage in our low-fat formula. Um, but as far as, as um, how much to add, I don't have um, a, uh, that information for you. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, someone would like to know, is there a way to gain access to the fecal score chart that was at the presentation? So if you have a uh, recent Purina um, product guide at your clinic, there's actually some really great resources at the back of the product guide um, in the resource section. So flipping through mine right now to tell you what page number. It's page 114 in the product guide. Um, so that's a nice, easy way to access it because most clinics will have a product guide somewhere floating around. If not, just ask your Henry Schein rep or you can ask your Purina veterinary consultant and they can actually order you copies of this. And what I like to do is laminate them and keep them in the exam room. And I usually have other resources. There's some really great nutrition resources on the Wasaba website, the World's Small Animal Veterinary Association website. They have a great nutrition toolkit with all sorts of great PDFs to print out to help your owners um, in the process of selecting just an over-the-counter diet. So I put that together. I put a body condition scoring chart in there. I put a scoring chart in there and I go through that stuff with my clients and I find that that's really helpful. Um, so yeah, so they're in the back of the product guide or your Purina Veterinary Consultant can order it for you. Um, they can order as many as you need in just um, their own single form. Excellent. Uh, another question someone wants to know, is the colostrum bovine colostrum? Yes, it is bovine colostrum, and that what was, is what was used in the study um, done by Dr. Arlie Reynolds out in Alaska. Great. Um, someone also know when are probiotics useful with regards to small bowel GI disease? So I honestly recommend probiotics in all cases of small bowel diarrhea. Um, I don't think that they're harmful really in any conditions. The only times that we steer away from maybe starting with a probiotic would be in a case where you're suspicious of some type of food allergy. It's not that probiotics inherently or are allergenic, but you don't necessarily want to start a supplement of any type when you're not sure what the food allergy might be. But probiotics can be really, really helpful, especially in your acute cases. Um, there's a few great probiotics out there in the marketplace. I just urge you to do your research and make sure that you're letting your clients um, know your recommendations as far as which probiotics to use. I really, really steer away from getting anything over the counter since there's really no um, regulation over that. And um, there was a good study done several years back by Dr. Weiss who looked at a uh, large group of veterinary probiotics and found only a couple of them actually met their label standards and had the organism they claimed to have in there. So make sure you're doing your research when selecting a probiotic. And in, in my experience, I've Put, when I was practicing full-time before joining Purina, I put all of my acute diarrhea cases on probiotics as part of their treatment. In some of your mild cases, you may be able to even avoid putting them on an antibiotic. Um, Dr. Audra Fenimore, um, at, she did her residency at Colorado State University. She's practicing in Denver now. She's an internist. She did a study um, looking at um, the combination of metronidazole with Enterococcus fasciam SF68, which is the probiotic fortiflora, and she was able to show that dogs, shelter dogs with diarrhea actually had um, diarrhea almost two days shorter duration when she used a combination of metronidazole with Fortiflora versus metronidazole by itself. Um, and we have many, many studies to show that the duration of diarrhea can really be decreased. Usually it's on average 1.8 days um, by using a, probi a probiotic as part of the therapy. And with that, I like to use that in combination with a highly digestible diet, at least short-term in some of our acute patients and long-term in our chronic patients. 
All right, we have one final question. Um, someone wants to know, should a low-fat GI diet be the first line of defense in small bowel GI disease? So I, I would say no. Um, I would say no in, in most cases. So it kind of depends on, on what you want to carry at your clinic. If you want to really streamline the number of GI diets you carry, and I can understand that because it can get a little bit overwhelming, a low-fat diet is, is appropriate for most GI conditions. However, when you feed an animal a low-fat diet, you're typically restricting calories, um, and you're typically um, affecting palatability somewhat in that diet as well. And then you're not getting some of the other benefits that we get from some of the GI diets out there on the market. So I can specifically talk about um, Purina's diets that we have added colostrum, which enhances the immune system, and then also those medium chain triglycerides, which we know are really, really beneficial in fat digestion because they're so much uh, easier to digest. So in um, some of our long-term cases, we may not want them to be on the lowest fat diet all the time because we're going to have to feed them more food to keep up with their calories um, that they need. So I really reserve it for some of those more extreme cases, um, for those um, recurrent pancreatitis cases, for some of those breeds that are prone to um, syndromes like hyperlipidemia or pancreatitis, um, high triglycerides, those are the dogs that I think need to be on an ultra low fat diet or some of those weird cases you see like lymphangiectasia or maybe a severe EPI case. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, Lauren. This has just been a great presentation. I'm sure everyone here has learned so much. Don't forget, attendees, EN Low Fat will be available on August 29th. Contact your Purina veterinary consultant or your Henry Schein representative to pre-order your buy one, get one free offer. For our live webinar attendees, when you exit the webinar, you're going to see a survey. Please complete every field in that survey in order to receive your CE certificate. You can expect to receive your CE via email in about two weeks. If you're viewing a recording of this webinar, you will not have the opportunity to earn any CE for it. Thank you again, everyone, for your attendance and attention. This ends today's webinar presentation.